Good evening. We are getting into uh, the ninth and 10th commandments tonight. Uh, they're bunched together, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, but let's join together in reading them out loud. First, you got the ninth commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or obtain it by false claims, but do all we can to help him keep it. And then the Tenth Commandment, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his workers, or his animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not force or entice away from our neighbor, his wife, workers, or animals, but urge them to stay and do their duty. <clears throat> so, both of these commandments have to do with the topic of coveting. And we'll talk about a little bit about what coveting is in just a moment. But they're broken up into two parts. And what we see here is that the ninth commandment <clears throat> deals more with coveting things that belong, uh, not things, but coveting your neighbor's property. And the tenth commandment would be uh, your neighbor's possessions, people, family, basically you'd say stuff uh, in general, uh, not so much property. Uh, as it was mentioned earlier, there are different ways of numbering the Ten Commandments. And uh, who was at church this last Sunday? You guys remember at all what uh, Pastor Racky said regarding the Ten Commandments? He, he mentioned something about uh, how the Jews have a, a, an altogether different numbering system. In fact, the Jews don't call them Ten Commandments. Really, they're called the Ten Statements. You guys remember that? And... The, the, the first commandment is not, you know, you shall have no other gods. What do they have as their first commandment or first statement? Do you remember that? I know it's been a few days, but I thought it was pretty, a pretty good insight. <clears throat> it, it is actually, the, the, the statement is, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. And very interesting to start things off that way, and I think very appropriate, too, that God is setting the, the stage here for what is to come in what we call the Ten Commandments. That is, I am the God who bailed you out of a hopeless situation. A God who acted on your behalf in ways that I have not done for any other nation in the history of this world before or since. You know, with the, the ten plagues that he unleashed upon Egypt with the parting of the Red Sea, and all these other things. God did that for them. And so he's, he, he, he tells them that at the start to set the stage, set the tone, to let them know that, hey, I've done this for you. Hopefully then, in return, in love and appreciation, you're going to then do what I am telling you to do. Now, the first three commandments, as we number them, govern our relationship with God. Commandments 4 through 8 govern our relationship with people. Commandments 9 and 10, these last two commandments, govern our private thoughts. Because coveting really is a sin that is exclusively done within or inside a person. Their thoughts, their desires, their attitudes, those sorts of things. And it's only, uh, coveting isn't something you do on the outside. Rather, it, coveting is something that leads to what you may do on the outside. So what is coveting? Well, coveting is a sinful and obsessive desire for something that isn't ours, and especially without due regard for the rights of others. So it's not just a desire but it's an obsessive desire. For example, years ago I preached on uh, a scripture reading from the Bible. Actually, uh, it'll be referred to coming up here in a little bit, 1 Kings chapter 21. And dealing with coveting, and my sermon started off like this. I want a new car. I drive a 1991 black cherry-colored Dodge Caravan. 
the sliding door, mind you back then, sliding doors, uh, they weren't the automatic ones. You had to crank that sucker open and push it shut. But a good portion of the bottom half of that sliding door was completely rusted away. So you could see the inner frame and everything. And we had, had other scratch marks and whatnot on it. Um, this thing was a total chick magnet, let me tell you. Not really. Um, it definitely was not going to attract the attention of anybody, unless if it was ridicule. Um, very functional, very practical, but not stylish at all. It had 150,000 miles on it, and the transmission was going to be uh, going bad shortly. I want a new car. Was it wrong for me to want something at that point in time, Jenica? Yeah. Is it wrong? To want a new car, especially when your current car is beat up, Graham? No. <clears throat> when does it become wrong? And that's where coveting comes into play. When it's not just a want, but where you are brooding about it, where you are obsessed about it. That is the difference. And we'll come back to that thought in a question later on. So what is God telling us in the ninth and 10th commandments? We've got a couple of passages here. First of all, Psalm 94, verse 11, page. The Lord is the God of the past. He knows that they are just vapor. Vapor, or in other words, empty or futile. Vapor is nothing, really. There's nothing, no substance to it. Uh, nothing substantial, anyway. So, the Lord knows the thoughts of mankind. Already giving us a big hint here at the answer to number one. But we're going to continue on with the next passage, Hebrews 4. Letitia? Okay, so notice there, um, the Word of God, living and active, but then is able to judge the ideas and the thoughts of the heart. So our question here, what is God telling us in the Ninth Commandment? He knows even when we think, not just think, but specifically in relation to the, these two commandments? Covet. covet. Yeah. He knows even when we covet. He knows those specific thoughts. <clears throat> so he knows when we have crossed the line. Coveting really is idolatry. That's what it really is. It's a, it's a specific form of idolatry where you are loving something more, or maybe someone more than God. Next part, that he will, yeah, judge us for our covetous desires. That even those things are accountable. So it's not just what we do, not just what we say, but even the thoughts, the attitudes that we have, that God will hold us accountable for. <clears throat> and there's a good reason for this too, not only just in regard to our faith and our loyalty toward God, but even in a practical way in this world, coveting is dangerous. And we're going to look at that here now in part three. First of all, we got James chapter 1, uh, verses 14 and 15. Aaliyah? But each person is tempted when he is dragged away. He's Enticed. Enticed. So the question here, we're going to pause for a moment. According to the italicized portion of these passages, we got the first passage at least, what makes coveting so dangerous? It says that when desire, that is coveting, uh, has conceived or come into being, what does it lead to? It can lead to murder. Well, no. I mean, well, it can, but that's not the only outcome. Um, more generically than murder. 
Interesting that you should mention murder. We'll hang on to that thought. But what does it say? If, what does it say coveting will lead to in this passage? Brody. <clears throat> Yeah, it leads to sin. And specifically, sin in word and action. <clears throat> and our next passage, or next section, actually really spells that out for us. Now, um, I'm not going to take the time to read this. I'm going to give you the summary of the story. All right? Sorry for if you open your Bible and we're going to be on it. Um, so back around, what, the year 850 B.C., somewhere in that range, uh, there lived a king in Israel named Ahab. Now, all the kings of the northern ten tribes of Israel were bad to one degree or the other. Ahab is regarded as the worst of the bunch. Uh, here was a bad dude. His wife, no better. Uh, her name was Jezebel. Uh, ladies, good reason why never to name your daughter Jezebel. You know, just like we don't name our sons Judas these days or Adolf. Um, you don't want to name your daughter a Jezebel. Uh, again, for good reason. So Ahab, as the story goes there in 1 Kings, uh, he happens to, to notice a particular vineyard belonging to a man named Naboth. Naboth, the Jezreelite. Jezreel, the Jezreel plain, uh, kind of the northern part of Israel, uh, south and west of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, just south of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, um, that, that cliff where they're going to chuck Jesus off of, uh, looks over the Jezreel plain. Uh, it's, it's sandwiched between two ridges or two lines of hills, we would call them hills. They would call them mountains. And I mean, they are significant, up in some cases, up to probably a thousand feet above the plain. Um, we've got an amazing view from up top, though. You can see this whole plain. Uh, but he's down there in the plain. He's got this vineyard down there. And it must have been a really good vineyard. So Ahab one day goes up to Naboth and says, You know what? I'm going to make you a deal. You know, like uh, what they say in God, I'm going to make you a deal you can't refuse. I'm going to offer you to pay, buy your vineyard, and in return, I'm going to give you something even better. Pause here. Has Ahab done anything wrong to this point? No. no. Absolutely nothing wrong with him making an offer on this vineyard. However, Naboth says, uh, the Lord forbid that I should uh, part ways with the inheritance of my fathers. And what he means by that is, is that several hundred years earlier, about 550 years earlier or so, when the Israelites first came into the land, that, and when the land was divided up, that that particular piece of land had gone to Naboth's direct ancestors and had been passed down through the generations finally to him. This was... God's specially chosen plot of land for his family. And even though there might have been a sweeter deal on the table, Naboth was happy and content with what God had given him. He did not want to give it up. And that was well within his right. In fact, a very uh, admirable thing on his part. At that point, what should Ahab have done? When when Naboth made it clear in no uncertain terms that this sale is not going to happen. He said okay. Said okay and okay. Yep, and moved on with life. Exactly. Instead, what Ahab does is he, the king, goes home and has a pity party on his pillow. Quite literally. He goes to bed, he sulks about it, he refuses even to eat. Why? Because he became obsessed about this vineyard. For whatever reason it was, he just had to have it. He couldn't get it out of his mind. He was coveting. In steps Jezebel. Jezebel asks, what's going on? And 
he, he you know, you know crybaby session here, tells her what, what happened. You know, he wouldn't let me buy his vineyard. And, well, she pretty much gives him a kick in the royal jewels. Um, calls into question his kingship, his manhood, all of the above. And says, are, are you the king? If you want something, just take it. And she says, you know what, get up. I'll take care of things for you. I'll get you that vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And so she arranges things uh, so that some scoundrels bring up false charges of blasphemy against Naboth. And they use that as a pretext to murder him. And he's killed. And Ahab goes and claims it. So what you said earlier, Graham, uh, <laughs> doesn't always lead to murder, but in this particular case, it did. And David, when he wanted Bathsheba as a wife? You know what? That's another good example of coveting. Now, that was a specific form of coveting called lust. All right? And um, that lust led him to do what he did. Uh, and then when it was found out that she was pregnant, the murder in this particular case was more a cover-up. It wasn't so much for him to get Bathsheba as much as it was to protect his own skin from being found out. Uh, but still, a good thought, good connection, because there was a form of coveting that was involved there that led to it. So while not directly connected, it still was one of those things that precipitated from it. So that gets us to question two then. What will covetous desires lead us to do? Not necessarily murder in every case, right? But, Jada, what is it going to lead us to do? If we really want something, somebody's not letting us have it, but we can't let go of the idea, what are we going to do? We're going to make bad decisions. Yeah, and those bad decisions are this, and we're going to find some way to scheme to get it. <coughs> in ways that we shouldn't. Kind of related to what uh, Graham was just saying here, uh, I, I'm aware of a situation where, right now, where a man really, 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 really wants the wife of another man. And has been trying to work an angle at it to, to get this, this woman. Well, this woman, to her credit, has said, uh, stop getting in contact with me and, and cutting them off. But, I, you know, and, and that's not the only time I've seen that happen. Um, one of my friends, uh, well, she was enticed away from her husband many years ago by, a, by another man. Now, granted, she was dissatisfied and had some reasons to be dissatisfied about her marriage, but... Um, they both did what was wrong. And there was, it was all because of coveting. So, part four then, how can we keep the ninth and tenth commandments? Uh, we got a few passages here. First of all, uh, we'll read the first couple and we'll pause. Uh, Brody, Hebrews 13.5. Be content with what you have. What does it mean to be content? Grateful. Okay. More than just grateful. What? No, never mind. No. What were you going to say? say okay. Yeah. That, I think you're a little bit closer to the, the mark with okay. Happy and grateful. For Happy, you grateful. Yeah, you're, you're okay. These are all kind of aspects of the, the one word I'm really trying to aim for here. You can't use the word to define the word. I'm asking, what does content mean? Happy. Appreciative. That's a part of it, too. Yep. Joyful. What's that? Excellent. Accepting. That's, again, a part of it. These are all part of it. Satisfied. Um. To be satisfied with what I have. Satis, meaning enough in Latin. Uh, that's where the word comes from, to be satisfied. Like I'm, I'm happy. I'm appreciative. I'm accepting. Uh, I'm okay with what I've got, I am not looking to aim for more in life. 
if I get more, great, but I don't need to have that more to make me happy. So be content with what you have. And the Apostle Paul, in the next passage, even tells us the conditions and circumstances under which we can be content. Caleb, Philippians 4, 11 to 13. I'm not saying this because I lack anything. In fact, I have learned to be content in, in any circumstances in which I find myself. I know what it is to live in humble circumstances, and I know what it is to have more than enough. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, while being full or hungry, while having plenty or not enough. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right. Notice, I've learned to be content in any circumstance of life. It doesn't matter if, if I'm well fed or I am hungry. Now, none of us have experienced true hunger in life. I, I, I feel pretty safe in saying. I've been pretty hungry a couple of times. In fact, one time, might have been around fourth grade age, maybe fifth grade, I don't know. But I remember this time that I had such fierce hunger pains in the afternoon. And I asked my parents for a, a quick, simple snack, but they said no. Uh, we were off to a wedding and then a reception. But uh, because of those hunger pains, I actually threw up. I was so voraciously hungry. Uh, have you ever experienced that before where you're so hungry that it caused you to throw up? You have. Yeah. It, it is, yeah, it, it, it was painful. And that is nothing compared to the true hunger that Paul probably experienced and others certainly have as well, uh, the pain of starvation. And yet, Paul, even in those moments, even when or he's either living in plenty or in want, in need, he says he's found the secret of contentment. And so question one, how can we keep the ninth and tenth commandments? First of all, by being content with whatever we have. So, first of all, revolving around our attitude. Now, as I said earlier, this is primarily about our attitudes, but having the proper attitude, you know, just as having the improper attitude will lead to sinful thoughts, words, and deeds, so also the proper attitude is going to lead us uh, to doing things that will help to keep, uh, uh, keep this commandment. Um, before we get to those specific things, we're going to have another passage which we'll circle back on in just a little bit, but uh, we're going to go through these uh, next four passages right away to get the second part to number one, and then again we'll circle back for number two. So, Psalm 73, verse 25, Jalen. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire but besides you? All right. Whom have I in heaven but you, God? And then Jada, uh, Genesis 39. Now we're going to get into those ways that we can... Um, Actively demonstrate keeping the ninth and tenth commandments. He has no one in his house greater than I am, and he has not withheld anything from me except me, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a great evil and sin against God? She kept speaking to Joseph day after day, but he would not listen to her. He would not lie down beside her or even be with her. All right. So what was going on here? We're talking about Joseph. Uh, one of the youngest sons of Jacob, all right, a great grandson of Abraham. Joseph, remember, had been sold by his brothers as a slave down into Egypt, and he ended up in the home of uh, one of, or maybe even the commander of the armies of Egypt, a guy named Potiphar. Well, by this time that this is all going down here, Joseph is, is in his late 20s, early 30s. And the dude's a stud, apparently, because Potiphar's wife has got a thing for him. All right? You know what I mean. And on several occasions, makes sexual advances toward him. And on this particular occasion, we see Joseph 
tell her something. Basically, in short, he first tells her to knock it off. All right? He's not going to lie down. He's not going to sleep with her. He's not going to commit adultery. She's a married woman. You need, and, and, and so if he's telling her no, what also, by implication, is he, she, is he telling her to do? Like, don't, don't be coming after me. Don't be hitting on me. Instead, what should she be doing? Yeah. <laughs> hitting on her husband, right? <laughs> In a way, you're right. But being faithful, going back to and being loyal to her husband. Yes. Next passage, Philemon 12. Um, Jenica. I have sent him. Onesimus. Onesimus, your slave, who is my very heart back to you. Welcome him. All right, so the Apostle Paul writing to a guy, a friend of his named Philemon. And what had happened was uh, one of Philemon's slaves, Onesimus, had run away and had come to, the, to Paul. Now, Paul... Understand this, he was morally opposed to the institution, the idea of slavery. All right? But he also knew that it would not be uh, productive and beneficial to encourage slaves to revolt and rise up against their masters. Uh, it would lead to violence, bloodshed, murder, and other sorts of horrible things. And so, uh, for the sake of peace and stability in society, Paul and the early history of the Christian church uh, basically uh, set, uh, had the mindset of, you know, if we're going to uh, work toward the abolition of slavery, we're going to do it by changing the attitudes of the hearts of people. And that's ultimately what happened. Um, now, Onesimus, he comes to Paul, and during this, his time with Paul, he becomes a Christian. All right? And now, Paul is encouraging Onesimus to go back and do his duty to be a faithful, loyal servant of Philemon. However, in the letter, he does tell Philemon, you know, I'm sending him back to you at, not just as a slave, but as a brother in the Christian faith. And if you regard him as a brother, uh, as you ought to, because he is then you need to be doing the right thing and freeing him from slavery. Uh, so there, there is that other side of it. But as far as Onesimus is concerned, you need to be uh, obedient, do your duty. Uh, the next passage, Exodus 23, Graham. You come upon an enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you certainly must bring it back to him again. All right, not like, ah, oh, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? If you know it's your neighbor's ox... You return it. Interestingly enough, my uh, wife, I don't know if she was looking out the window today, but she saw somebody's grill cover getting blown down the road from the winds today. She, wasn't, she, she figured it was one of two houses, so she did what she could. She went out and got it. She didn't take it back in, but she went and returned it. You know, in, in essence, that's what Paul is talking about here in, this, in these, or, or not Paul, Moses is talking about in Exodus 23. So the second part to this question here, how can we keep the ninth and 10th commandments? It's by urging our neighbor's family, workers, and animals to stay and do their duty. <laughs> Just remembered another instance. This one happened to me personally. So this was long before I met my wife. Uh, I was doing online dating. I think this was back in the day when Thrivent Financial had an online dating thing on their site. And this one young lady from Illinois, so it would have been a little bit of a longer drive, uh, got it, reached out and got in touch with me and okay, started talking just a little bit, nothing deep or whatever. Let me just say I am really, 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 really glad I decided to do some Facebook stalking. Because through that, I happened to find her profile. And through that, I happened to find out that well, although she is Wells, she was still married. I would have been guilty of having an affair with a married woman. I happened to get enough information 
from pictures and whatnot on her Facebook profile to figure out where it is she went to church. I contacted that pastor. I said, do you have so, such and so, so and so as a member? Yeah. Is so and so married? Yeah. Well, she's uh, uh, contacted me through the online dating site and Thrive. And he's like, oh boy, okay, well, I'll, I'll take care of this. So, <laughs> sorry to dump that problem on your plate, but <laughs> ultimately, no, you got to stay with your husband. You're married to him. Okay, like I said, we're going to circle back now uh, to question number two, or really circling back to Psalm 73. Paul says that he has learned the secret of contentment in Philippians. That is the secret of how to be content no matter what life throws at you. According to the underlying portion in Psalm 73, what is that secret? What is that secret of contentment? It's knowledge. But knowledge of what? Quinn? Because it's thing that don't really matter because we just have Yeah, we have the greatest treasure of all already. We've got the Lord. Not that we own the Lord, but uh, think of it in these terms here. Um, do you ever talk about your mom and dad and you say, my mom or my dad? Right? Um a possessive pronoun. Now, do you own your mom or dad? Of course not, but it's talking about a relationship. We have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. We have Him. He is the giver of every perfect gift. And what is greater to have, the gift or the giver of the gift? Of course, it is the giver of the gift. And if we have God, if we have Jesus, we are wealthy beyond our wildest dreams because there is an inheritance waiting for us that we cannot possibly begin to fathom or comprehend. Now, you guys are too young for this yet, um, and I'm only just coming into this first experience of it myself in the last, uh, well, almost a couple of years ago now, and again, coming up in a little bit, where uh, I'm, I shouldn't say I, my wife actually, but I, through my wife, am uh, benefiting from an inheritance. Uh, her aunt died a few year, a couple of years ago. She had no, uh, no husband, no kids, and she, uh, in her will, declared that the estate would be split up equally among Amaris and her two sisters. Well, round one of that inheritance uh, was coming up on two years ago. Uh, they just closed on the house here on March 1st, here, 2024. Uh, so that's the last thing that's on the plate. And a good, oh, well, her mom and dad are going to get a little bit of a cut for, we're going to do that for them. At least that's the plan for all the work that they've done and helped out with. They deserve some. Uh, but we're going to be getting a little bit more as well. Now, mind you, it's not like she had a big honking mansion by any means. We're, we're, we're not talking six figures here, okay? But it is still a nice boon for us, uh, a benefit that will, will help us uh, in a financial sense and provide some, a little bit more stability. Uh, that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, yeah, obviously we miss her aunt and everything. Uh, but it is a, a blessing that, that that gets passed down to us. That pales in comparison to the inheritance that awaits us in heaven. You can't even begin to compare. And if you've got that, all the stuff in this world, it doesn't really matter. I mean, this, this world, and we get so focused on it, contains, you know, is this much of our existence compared to a line that goes that direction in infinity. It means so little, this time in this world, compared to the life that awaits us. And when you think about it in those terms, we have that, that greatest treasure to just think about that through faith in Christ. Okay, 
Um, do we have a couple more passages? Yes, we do. Uh, let's read Galatians 5.13, Quinn. After all, brothers, you were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as a starting point for your sinful flesh. Rather, serve one another through love. Yeah. You're free. Now, that doesn't mean that you are free to go and live however you want, free to sin. No, that's going back to the old slavery, uh, being slaves to sin again. Rather, no, use your freedom in Christ to serve one another in love just as Christ served us. And then Philippians 2, verse 4, Macy. Let each other of you look carefully not only to your own interests, but also to your... Also, also to the other interests. Also to the interests of others, yeah. So don't be so, don't live in a self-interested way, meaning you're looking out just for yourself, how you can gain an advantage and, and get ahead in life. Be looking how you might be able to serve others, be a benefit to others. And that includes in respect to their property, in their possessions, and their, their people and family as well. So according to the double underlined portions here, what two encouragements does God give us to help us keep the ninth and tenth commandments? First of all, serve one another in love. And secondly, put the interests of others above our own interests. What's that? Oh, <laughs> no. That's a sharpener. I knew what she was getting up for. Okay. So the ninth and tenth commandments in my life. Number one, coming back to what I had said earlier, is it wrong to want a new phone, new car, new house, and so on? No. No. When does it become wrong? No, not when we're fine with what we have. When we're content. When we're, that's, not, that, that's good to be content. When content is the good when thing. When we're not content and... Yes, Paige? When we become obsessed. Obsessed about wanting something that we don't have. And maybe also, you could even add sometimes, shouldn't have. It's not yours to have. But it doesn't have to necessarily be something that you shouldn't have. I mean, I would love to have that $800 uh, Millennium Falcon Lego set. That would be awesome. Or the, the $800 AT, AT Lego set. Those things would be sweet. But I don't have to break bank to go and get it. I don't need to have it. That's another thing, too. We often confuse that word need with want, right? I need it, right? Well, how many times when you say need, is it really want, Brody? Quite a bit, right? Yeah. Yeah, we do that quite a bit. Uh, I need this. Well, what do you mean you need this? Like, you're going to die if you don't have it? Probably not. So. All right. Question two, not including the things, examples I listed up here, what are some things that people might covet? Paige? Other people. Other people. What do you mean by that? Elaborate a little bit. Like someone else is like white bag. All right. Or does it, let, let, does it have to be a married person? No. 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 I will admit, I coveted the idea of having a wife prior to getting married. I full on coveted it. I wanted it so bad. And I, I spent way too much of my time in my adult life brooding over that and thinking about it. And let me tell you, nothing that you covet is going to be as good as what you think it is. And I'm not saying that to diss or knock my wife at all. I love her. But when you elevate something to, or in this case, an idea, to a God status, you are going to be disappointed with it in this world because it is not God, it is not perfect. 
you know, we all by nature have a hole in our hearts. And the shape of it is God. And the only thing that is big enough and has the correct form to fit that hole is God himself. If you try to put other things in there, it's going to be a bottomless pit and will not give you the contentment, the satisfaction, the happiness, the joy, the peace that only really God can bring. The heart is restless until it finds its rest in God. And having God is ultimately all that matters. So, people, and it could be for any reason, it could be, like I said, with, with my sin of, um, you know, coveting uh, the, the desire for, uh, my desire I had to be married. It could be also just friendship, right? You could covet the friendship of a person and be envious and jealous that somebody else is getting that attention. And maybe that's another thing as well, attention. You could turn attention into coveting. Quinn? People you see online. Ah, tell me more. Like if you see an influence or something and you're like, oh, I want to be like that person. Okay, where you kind of idolize like somebody. Respect, like, oh, I want to do more of that or something. Okay, okay so you're, you're talking about... Like don't obsess. You, you see somebody, um, a, a blogger or whatever, some sort of uh, social media influencer, and they're living this, this flashy, fast-paced, sorry, uh, exciting life, right? And you, you, you might covet that. Or, and this one is especially for you ladies, you look at uh, a lot of the pictures of women out there. And you might have a little bit of body secure or body insecurity because you, you uh, will fight and strive to have that perfect looking physique and skin and so on. And, and Ladacia's like, nope, I'm way too above all that garbage. Good for you. Good. That is good. Unfortunately, as you know, there are a lot, and especially of women, who are like that not realizing that the chances are 10 out of 10 that what has been done to those pictures, Photoshop, airbrushed, all those things, you know, bodies, portions cropped or, or whatnot to make the figure look better, the, um, you know, the, the, the rolls in the skin so easy to disappear and all of that and like try to get that idealized body. So that's a good one. What else? And, and I hope you guys are writing these down because these are these are good. What else? Yeah. No, I don't know why I did that. Oh, okay. It's <laughs> just a, I get these random impulses. Grace Mog said career. I thought that was a really good one. She mentioned career in class yesterday. Uh, some people can get so focused on pursuing their career that they end up crowding God out of their lives in the pursuit of it. Now, do you have a legit hand? I don't know. If people go, like, places to work, like, gyms or, like, people's houses, like, shopping. Okay. You got a bunch of different ones. I mean, shopping, coveting, uh, just... Having a high fashion, maybe, uh, style, uh, gym, a gym rat, right, who is pursuing the perfect physique. Um, that could be a, a form of coveting. Sports. Yeah, the relentless pursuit. It's insane uh, the amount of time that children will be thrust into sports these days. Yeah, they're giving some really good ones here. Um, much better than just the, the simple ones that I have here. Money, affection, spouse, car, video game. I mean, really, you could make anything into an object that you covet. I mean, these things are neither good nor bad. They just are. They can be blessings, but we can also make them our idols. Ladisha. Sure. Okay, 
For the bold paragraph there, have you ever wanted something so bad, or really should be so badly, that you literally cried about it when you didn't get it? Have you ever thrown a temper tantrum if you didn't get what you want? Uh, I'm sure all of us did when we were toddlers. Caleb's like, yeah, I probably just did that last week. No. Oh, yeah, okay. totally. <laughs> I wanted McDonald's, yeah. Has something or someone become more important to you than God himself? Have you schemed to get something that didn't belong to you? If so, then you are guilty of coveting. God also once wanted something really, really badly too. However, it wasn't a favorite toy or a smartphone or an expensive car. It was you. It was your heart, your love, and your salvation, your presence with him in heaven. And God wanted all this so much that he went to the most extreme ends to make it happen. Paige, please read for us Matthew 4, verses 8 to 10. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Right. Did Satan honestly own all things? No. 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 In, in the big pick sense of the word, no. However, does Satan have a certain a level of influence and control over this world? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, in a way, you could maybe say that, yes, he could kind of give Jesus what he was offering, but not really. At least not in the way that uh, would be good and beneficial. Jesus, though, not interested, right? He's got more important things on his heart and mind. First of all, his love for his Father in heaven. He's not going to worship uh, anybody other than, than God. But he also has you and me in his heart and mind, too. And for that reason, he did not fall into this temptation. Hebrews 12, verses 2 to 4. Ladesha. Resisted. Resisted to the point of shedding your blood in your fight against sin. So, in view of the joy set before him, the joy of having you in heaven with him, the joy of having you safe from eternal judgment, he went and faced that eternal judgment for you on the cross. Joy in going to the cross. There are a lot of things I could think of that would make me joyful in life, and going to the cross isn't one of them. And yet it was a joy for him because of the outcome of it. And so he did not hesitate to do that. He was fighting to free us from that. And notice that last part. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your fight against sin. The battle, the temptation, uh, the battle against the temptation to covet is very real, very in uh, the temptation is very strong. But I'm willing to bet that none of you have had to shed your blood in an effort to fight it. At least not as Jesus literally shed his blood to reclaim you and me for himself and for all the good and right reasons, not selfish reasons. So question three, in Jesus we see the embodiment of content and even self-imposed poverty as he literally gives up everything to come down to earth and live and die as the poorest of the poor. How do his active obedience and passive obedience give us hope when we break the ninth and 10th commandments? 
The answer is that he kept those commandments perfectly for us and died to make us rich with his forgiveness and the treasures of heaven. He was not looking to his own interests, but to the interests of others, namely your interests, my interests. That's what he wanted. And that leads to the last question. Question number four. What gave Jesus such joy? I've already stated it. What gave him such joy that he would endure the cross? Jalen? He won us back. Mm -hmm. The joy of having us with him in heaven. So to wrap it up here, coveting or simple desires. First of all, don't, the don't do, don't, uh, you know, basically don't covet anything that doesn't belong to you. Don't obsess about it. You can want something, it's fine. But don't stew over it if you can't get it. Be happy and okay, ready to set it aside because you've already got better things. Instead, Find that secret of contentment. You are already rich with the sacrifice of Christ. Being generous. Showing gratitude and concern for others. Generosity and expressing generosity is a good way of practicing this commandment because uh, when you practice that, it becomes, like anything else in life, a habit or a pattern. And it will help to mitigate those covetous desires. And then we will be satisfied with what we have. Any questions at all? All right, we'll close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us all. Amen. Have a good night.